Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. I highly encourage everyone tuning in to join us in the Artblocks Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the show notes below. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest who returns back to After Dinner Mints for a second time. I want to welcome back generative artist Harvey Rayner. Hey, Ponyo, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Harvey? It's so great to see you again. Yeah, very good to see you. Yeah, I, so I, for people who don't know, Harvey was in Marfa just a couple of weeks ago. So it was great to you know meet you and, and part of your family. And we'll talk a little bit about Marfa a little bit later on. But yeah, why don't we kick things off? So this is the second time you're on After Dinner Men's. So the previous time we dug in to, to kick things off, we, we spoke a little bit about your background. So if people are interested in learning more about your background, um, feel free to to jump in that. But maybe for people who haven't tuned into your first show together, our first show together, maybe you can just give us like kind of a quick, brief uh, intro into your background. Sure. Um, so I've been making generative art for about ten years, and prior to that, I've been making kind of digital art for about fifteen years, so about twenty five years in total. Um, up until you know, I dropped on art blocks. So. You know, I wasn't earning a living from, from making art, but I've always been pretty dedicated, you know, maybe two, three, four hours every day making something. So, um, and, you know, uh, I've always kind of earned my living from doing other things, other creative projects. I've done a lot of house construction. I've designed kind of experimental greenhouses. And we have, my wife and I have a, a small uh business called Moonleap and we manufacture meditation cushions. So um, I've always kind of kept the art separate from, from making a, making an income just because what I've always wanted to make is never really, I've never really seen an, a, like an easy way to sell it. So, but now with, uh, you know, NFT generative art, art box and so forth, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a done deal. It's kind of, I, I, so I do this all the time now. That's great. And, you know, we, uh, you, you've done a release already on Artblox prior to Fontana, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. And it was called Photon's Dream. And that was discussed more in detail in our previous episode. But, you know, following the release, did you take a, a break or, you know, did you kind of begin work on your next project, was, which is uh, Fontana? Um, no, I didn't take a break. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've been waiting for this moment for so long that, <laughs> you know, I feel like I have some momentum and I don't want to stop, you know, I'm kind of going to Marfa actually after, after the event, which I love, you know, I was just itching to get back to my computer. <laughs> so no, I don't feel like I need a period to recover at all. I was just dying to get back and, 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 and build another project. But with Photon's Dream, that was a process I, you know, I had to, I sort of promised some, some airdrops and some prints and so forth. So I had to take care of that. Um, but it's, you know, after a couple of weeks, I was already kind of, I started, I started Fontana and, um, it, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, if I could do this seven days a week, every day, I would, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally understand. And, you know, has anything changed in your practice since working with our blocks? Um, uh, yeah, totally. Um, well, obviously just time. I mean, I guess that's the main thing. You know, weekends and so forth, you know, throughout my whole life, I've always spent all day making art, you know, but obviously if, if you're not making an income from it, I need, I need to, just, you know, during the week, I could only do that in the mornings or evenings. So, so that's the main difference. Now I can actually spend a lot of time doing it, but also like, if I'm honest, like the support of my family, they're now interested in what I'm doing. And that's not just because it makes money. I think it's because there's, you know, it's real engagement and, and they can see the, the work out there alive in the world, in, interacting with people. So they're kind of much more engaged themselves in what I'm doing. So that's a big change, you know, having their support and their interest with what I'm doing. And to the extent where they actually, they have, you know, they want to give feedback and they contribute, I think, to my process. You know, I, I like to run everything I do by them. Uh, my, my door and my wife I'm referring to really, my dog doesn't count. <laughs> so i so i like to uh you know get and, and they give good advice you know um 
uh, I think my door especially has got a very sort of, sort of refined aesthetic sense. And she, she really sort of like steered me with Fontana. I think she pushed me to keep, to keep it around and, and re refine the kind of color algorithm because she, you know, she works in interior design and she, she would, would come in and say, no, nobody's going to put it on their wall. And that wasn't something I was even thinking of before, you know, Fontana. So, so that's a big change. Um, just and long form generative art is so different. You know, it's different from making just generative art and cherry picking. It was it's, Photon's dream was really a process for me of getting my head around what long form generative art could be, or just even is. You know, what and kind of like understanding the whole minting process and the, sort of like how a work is realized through that minting process through the community and stuff it's so different on so many different ways so so the way i think about making art now is totally different um long form generative art you i think one of the big differences is like i'm not so precious about individual outputs whereas when you're making art and you're trying to get this the one right you're trying to make one artwork you can i i personally was I would be very precious about what I've done. Whereas if you make an algorithm, you see a nice thing come up on the screen, but you just, you can just let it go because it's, it's you know, the, the project is this complete, um, you know, it's all the mints together. And so, um, so that's very different. Um, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of it sort of still the same. I think I've been doing this so long that it just, yeah. it's very natural. It, you know, it doesn't like, I think, you know, I met a lot of artists in Martha. I've talked to, I, I like to talk to a lot of artists, and especially younger ones. Um, they often have a lot of self-doubt. And I would say in my 20s, I, I, I went through that, you know, it was tough, you know, trying to find what you want to say as an artist, trying to find your unique voice and just doubt in everything you do. It's a long process. And I think for many artists, it takes 10 years or so of just making art and kind of like, feeling crappy about it <laughs> and sort of like building confidence. So as I went through that period, I'd say in my twenties, now I'm, I'm pretty confident about what I want to make. And it's, you know, it just feels like a natural, and I don't really doubt myself. Maybe I should, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think if Fontana is, it means anything to, I mean, just, just seeing the, the block talk and, the community so receptive of, you know, Photon's dream for sure, you know, back in June, but then also Fontana, which was released as a curated drop just a few weeks ago and kind of just see things take off. And it, it's been really, really great to see. And you, I know you put in so much hard work and you're very active in kind of just like the artist community. And so it's just been really great to see. So I don't know, I, I for one, I'm a huge fan and it just like, it's been really great to kind of see your, your projects, you know, grow from one to the other. And, and and speaking of, you know, your projects, I'm I'm curious to know when you think about a a follow up project, do you uh, do you generally incorporate elements from previous projects, or do you start, you know, completely from scratch? Um. So yes, I mean, Photon's Dream obviously it was a big kind of change, right, to Fontana. It was pretty much starting from scratch, everything. I didn't care. I mean, I just used a totally different kind of uh, t technical process. I used SVG. Um, Fontan uh, Photon Stream was kind of written a bit like a shader. It wasn't a shader, but it was, you know, it was built pixel by pixel. It was, and in some ways, Fontana was like going back to stuff I was doing earlier on in my artistic, I'm going to say career. It wasn't really a career. <laughs> um the, the sort of more geometric hard lines graphical kind of like elements that was always what i did and then 10 years ago i guess i took this detour into exploring these geometric objects or kind of waveforms and that's what photon's dream became but really fontana i think is just a movement back to what i used to do um and so yeah i, I started kind of from scratch but then i built it on a bunch of you know i've been building these things for so long, I've I can kind of draw on libraries I've built myself, processes I'm very familiar with. So, but uh, I think the tech, like the textures in Fontana were very new for me. You know, like the, the paper, I call it a paper texture, obviously it's not paper, but, and, and the kind of wear markings around the edge, that was the, 
that was a very different approach than anything I'd ever done before. And um, that's something I really want to explore more. But I guess that even came out of things I've done before in my life. You like well, the house remodeling I've done. I, you know, I've, I'm really into old worn materials and sort of like repurposing. So I think that's where that partly came from. Um, but you asked me, you know, uh, yeah, so yeah, I do use some things, but I think every once in a while you've got to start from scratch, right? I mean, like I'm the project I'm working on now, Vellum, it's got some, it's got a sort of slightly Fontana feel to it with the textures and so forth, but I'm not going to keep packing. I'm not going to keep pushing that another maybe project down the road. I'll, I'll start that whole thing again and, you know, cool. tired after yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, let's jump into Fontana. And uh, so Fontana is Latin for fountain, for anyone that doesn't know. And I'm, I'm curious to know, like, how did you land on that name for this particular project? Um, so, so I, you know, I had this idea of, of creating the outputs with this certain geometric kind of thing I've been interested in for many years. And I created a few outputs and it just, they just seemed to feel like they were they look to me like a phantom. They kind of look like a squirt, you know. Um, and actually, I mean, the, the the language I've developed over the years to talk about these geometric objects, part of these things that kind of spray off, I, I, that's what I call them. I call them sprays. So I guess I always had this idea of fountain in relation to this geometric object. But then... Um, and then I kind of also was kind of interested in this idea of capturing movement with these very sort of static elements. So, I mean, I write about this in my kind of thesis, but, you know, I've always been fascinated with the idea of trying to do this impossible thing, right, of, of capturing motion with geometry, something that's very, very static and looks like it's uh, kind of mechanically drawn, you know, and so, you know, hence kind of like, I think, you know, I try to make something look like maybe it had been hand drawn, like in, in, in the sense of like being a technical drawer. And so you've got this very sort of long methodical process capturing this very sort of dynamic, fluid, kind of, you know, capricious movement. And I like that tension. Um, so Fontana. So I guess there's another thing, you know, uh, I, I should be honest about this. So, you know, I, after Photon's Dream, I really looked at, the whole catalog of art blocks work. And I thought, well, you know, I, I really wanted to understand what worked in this space and what didn't, what sold well. So, you know, I, I'd done a lot of research and of course, Fidenza, you know, everybody talks about, you know, block talk, you know, what's the next Fidenza? <laughs> and somebody made a comment in there. They, they referenced another project and it started with F and it was seven, <laughs> it was seven letters that it ended in A and, it's just, and it was an Italian town. I thought, oh, but but coincidentally, at the time, I'd already thought of Fontana, and I thought, oh wow, look, it's got seven letters. It begins with F. It's an Italian town. <laughs> yeah. So it seemed like I've got to use that, right? Because you know, uh, just because it kind of has a reference to Fidenza. Not that it is, you know, not that it is. Mm -hmm. But I, it, it was just kind of like it was almost like a joke or or a nod, a nod to Fidenza, and kind of like, and you get that in NFT, right? People make a nod to past projects yeah yeah definitely that's awesome well that's really cool i didn't i didn't know that so i appreciate you yeah, sharing I really that with us for that was that contrived but but it, i mean it wasn't because i'd already thought of the name before i realized that there was this kind of like mm -hmm. you know, connection there so yeah that's yeah. great well yeah tell us about the theme for for fontana well um so you know so there's, there's a theme of the, the the movement capturing the movement but there was also um, you know, I'd always been interested in, uh, you know, I have a passion for 20th century art and one of the movements I like a lot, although, you know, there's not that many individual pieces within the movement I like that much, but I like the idea it was, was futurism. So, and uh, futurism, I can't remember the data, early 19th century, but it was an Ita primarily Italian movement and the, the artists were kind of trying to kind of capture this new machine age of where there was this kind of new sense of movement and you know there was these new sort of like big fast trains and, and cars and so forth and where society was kind of 
like go through its this big transition, mainly kind of like fueled by you know new technology. And and I thought actually there's a, there's a parallel there with what you know this where we're at actually you know with with generative art and you know things like uh, decentralized kind of this is these big shifts in in science and technology and so I thought well you know there's there's something to play with there so. Um, you know, I wanted, so the way I kind of referenced that, apart from this idea of movement and trying to make things look like they were kind of in motion was, uh, like the, the color outputs. Um, and I wanted them, I mean, futurism doesn't really have particular color palettes, but I just wanted to reference that period in time, you know, the art design media that come from that time. So, um, and even that's kind of slightly strange because, you know, it's not that they didn't have purples and greens and things in that time, but they tend to fade out in the media. So, mm -hmm. so our impression of thing, you know, uh, so I hope it evokes that kind of 1930s, 40s kind of vibe. People say that it does, some people say it kind of reminds them of the 70s. I don't know, but I wanted it to look old anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, I, earlier you kind of mentioned a little bit about, you know, house remodeling, um, but yeah, so for many years, I know you worked as a house remodeler, you know, and your preference has grown towards using reclaimed and worn materials and surfaces. And I'm curious, you know, how has that impacted, you know, how you create art today? Um, well, it's fun to so see with, yeah. So after Photon's Dream, I had a certain mindset when I built Photon's Dream and I wanted, I, I didn't ask, I saw certain other people making projects which I I came up with this term called trad realism so it was this imitation of old design me of old sort of art design media so you know things that looked like paint which was create which were created generatively and to be honest when I first saw that I thought oh this is just holding on to the past and I didn't like it uh so I, I set about writing an essay called you know about trad realism realism but I wanted the essay itself to be neutral so I wrote pros and cons and in the process of writing the, the pros I actually started to kind of convince myself actually this is you know there's a lot of merit to having these kind of very warm textures and and there's something just maybe innate in humans that like that feeling of kind of um being surrounded in, in sort of like worn surfaces which have a history um and I, you know, I, I personally do, you know, this, this, where I'm recording this is, is kind of like my studio, but the house we live in is, is covered in, you know, all, all the materials are very sort of like, they have a history and, and a story, you know, you can, you can tell, see from the marks, you know, where some of these materials have been used in barns and so forth. So, and it's very comforting. I think it kind of like, my, my kind of feeling is that, you know, if you're surrounded in it, in imperfect materials, then you're, you're more accepting of your own imperfections. <laughs> this is, so if you imagine living in a very sort of clean style or had sterile house, you kind of have to live up to that, right? You have to be perfect, but maybe if you live in these kind of more natural worn environments, it's just more homely and kind of, so, so that, I guess that was the main reason I went with, um, sort of trying to implement that with Fontana and that, and the fact that it looked like it was something that people really liked, you know, uh, any cyclone had that kind of vibe, you know, um, it was, it just looked like maybe an emerging trend in, in gen art and thinking, I've been thinking about it again recently. And I think, well, maybe it's not because it might be just, you know, people have painted pictures for, for, for many, you know, for thousands, hundreds of years, let's say, and you can do a lot of different things with paint, but we settle on certain textures and things that we like. And it might be that, when, that you know, if you, we we'll always come back to those particular types of textures, whatever medium you use, whether it's generative or paint or, you know, there's a certain, so it's not like the textures, it's not that we like those textures because they're paint. We've, there's something deeper there that we, we kind of always going to be drawn to. So whatever art we make, we may come back to something that kind of looks like those old mediums. Um, but I, I, I haven't really formulated that idea very well in my head yet, but I'm, I'm probably going to write another essay on that at some point. 
Yeah, yeah, that's great. And I I'm also just wondering how you kind of decided on the shapes and patterns for Fontana. Is that something that, you know, you kind of took from those previous projects or is that something that's kind of evolved, you know, over the course of, of, of coding the project itself? It's a, it's a bit of both. Um, yeah, so for me, like working with the code, a lot of the forms do come out of the kind of like the process of kind of like um, find, finding the, you know, a way to represent them in code. It's kind of like this kind of cycle. Um, but I did originally, I mean, there's a basic geometric form in there, which actually probably most people don't even see this, but it is related to Photon Stream. It's just like an inversion. <laughs> of the, the way the waveforms that make photon stream if you if you kind of like mark lines on the waveforms that run right uh, sort of like perpendicular to all the waveforms you get this other type of in kind of inversion and that's that forms the basis of fontana i do have a little diagram i can share here it's pretty crude but yeah yeah absolutely um, i'm gonna have to swing this onto another monitor okay so yeah so, um, so the photons dream here. Now, if you draw a line that's perpendicular to these waveforms, like these blue lines here, these these blue lines kind of like delineate the the forms in in Fontana. So, I don't, can you see my cursor? Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. This point here, I call it a source. That would be equivalent to this point in the middle here this red line here would be this this line here and these blue lines kind of uh they they kind of yeah they're these these sprays i call them whereas on photon stream it's the gray lines here but th there's a relationship and it's just that um you know these, this this set of arcs is uh, uh at a right angle let's say to these to these uh, circles here. So, and, and this particular geometric form, um, I've used this for, you know, for two decades now. I and mean, I've done, I've, I've played with it in lots of different ways. And, and my next, you know, next project, uh, Quasi Dragon, uh, Dra Quasi Dragon Studies, it also has this, these, these elements, this kind of fan type element in the background. Again, it's drawn on the same sort of structure um so there is a there is a connection there cool that's awesome and i, I do want to touch base on your use of generative color the generative color, color algorithm um yeah tell us about that process and you know why you decide why you decided to go that route okay um uh so that is something i wanted i did want to do with uh photons dream and i did have a generative color algorithm in that but at the last minute, I bottled it. I think I talked about this in my last uh, mm -hmm. in a minute, and I kind of checked it out. And I just put some preset. They weren't preset palettes, but they were preset kind of like um, parameters, which fed into the algorithm. So, but this time, after after I dropped out, I thought, no, I'm going to really, I'm going to commit to doing it this time. So, um, and I haven't done it, and you know, Fontana being well received. I will probably do this for every project now. Um, so yeah, so I wrote this article about it, um, and I, I mean, I just go through the process briefly, I guess. But so, um, so actually, so for the first first ten years that I made art, I made, I worked strictly in black and white. I didn't touch color, and that was primarily because. Um, I really was fascinated with composition and structure and I, and somehow it was easier to explore that for me anyway, in black and white, it was like color for me back then was this essential element that I didn't need. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I made all this out of black and white, but then at some point I did decide to transition to using color, but I, but when you so one of the sort of like basic problems we have as artists when we start to use color is that color if you see the spectrum here you know obviously like yellow is if you make it black and white this square here is this spectrum here made black and monochrome 
certain colors are a lot more lighter than other colors. So obviously your blue is very dark. And this kind of interferes with the, the tonal structure of your composition when you start introducing colors. So, um, so this is actually a very basic, easy way of kind of getting this what I call tonally balanced spectrum, where you basically you you you, you take a, a a monochrome version of your spectrum, you invert it, and then you just add these two together, and you get this, which is if you make this uh, monochrome. You know, it's it's totally balanced. It's not going to be lighter and darker in certain areas. So, so this spectrum is my starting point of my algorithm. Um, and then I just do, uh, I do a few simple things. I mean, this this is kind of where it starts to get kind of arbitrary. You know, there was there was a lot of outputs which were um, just too purple and too green, to put it simply. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And this is where my, my influence from my daughter was coming in, you know. Um, so, you know, this, I just simply reduced the saturation in, in the purples a little bit and the greens, I totally kill them. Um, and then this, this little diagram just represents kind of like the distribution of how the colors are used within the algorithm. It do doesn't really explain how I do it, but it just kind of gives you a sense. This is kind of like represents Fontana in terms of, um, the, the probability of a color appearing, uh, and, uh, and there's the original spectrum just to contrast. Um, I think this thing here is just explaining wh where I choose my background colors. Is, again, it's just just an arbitrary map within the color space. It's not anything complicated. Now, the real, I think the real kind of, I would not, well, the real kind of like magic in the in the algorithm is this idea of kind of like modulation and I call it like, well, I don't call it anything, but it's kind of like this twist in the who. So, um, so we have a, so the, the colors are modulated, they go black, like, you know, light black, um, light dark, like dark. But as, as they kind of go through that modulation, the hue also twists. So um, it probably doesn't make any sense at all. But if you look here, obviously you've got the hue as, as this this line here might represent how I feel the spray forms in Fontana. So they might start mm -hmm. off black and then go light. And then that that dark light contrast becomes less as you go through the, through the sprays. And also the, the hue twists. So it starts off with green and it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. So you've got this change in value which is light and dark, and you also got this change in who. And this is something I've been playing with for a number of years. I first built an al a color algorithm for a, a project called um, patterncooler.com, which was this pattern resource for graphic designers. And it had this little, well, it's still, still up online. People can use it and download patterns. And, but it's got this little algorithm in there where you can generate colors. And I used this process back then so um so i've kind of taken it from that um i'm curious to know like what were your biggest challenges you know using a, a generative color al algorithm it sounds like there's a lot of guess and checking just to make sure it's kind of honed in on at least something that you would you would you know like for the final product yeah it's a lot of kind of refining uh, I think of it like, you know, if you think of all colors as a three-dimensional space, which is often represented as a three-dimensional space, it's kind of like sculpting that space. You know, you're removing chunks of it. And it's actually surprising how much you can remove and still have a lot of variety within the within a project. You know, um, I'm, you know I'm a big Rembrandt fan, and, but Rembrandt used like, you know, four or five colors his whole life pretty much you know but he produced you know because of the sort of like way he modulated the colors and just juxtaposed this very subtle shifts it looks like they're much it's much richer um i think this is one of the most valuable lessons i learned at art school you know like being forced to paint with a very limited palette was like is a you know it was a is a revolution a, a revelation so um 
so that was so it's kind of sculpted in that space and removed and, and then finding a way to kind of get to make the kind of like make the colors kind of like dance within that very limited range and you know with fontana um the thing that i was really happy with in the end was like the, the use of the accent colors um so to, that was probably the most complicated thing getting the right accents in the right well not so much in the right place because that's kind of um, it's not out of my control but um just in the right proportions and the right amount it's kind of like the season and in a meal right you if you take the salt away and just a couple of little spices it's a little bland yeah but you need that basic umami sort of richness right and then you add the little spice at the end and it just lifts the whole or little little square of lemon juice that's kind of that's what the accents are doing so finding the right accents is is you know is, is a big challenge um again you know i've got, I've got my people to come in here and tell me when it doesn't work i mean i get sense obviously but i think having some other people to bounce 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 off you know sometimes pushes you to go a little further definitely yeah and it makes them like if you're talking about your family like your wife and your daughter it's great that because they're like a part of the process you know with creating this art i'm sure when they see you know these outputs and they see some of the suggestions that they made out as like a part of the final product i'm sure that I would hope that it, like make them happy and be like, oh yeah, like I was a you know partial influence in in making right. that particular output happen. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, they yeah they're really kind of behind the project and you know, I mean, in my, own, my you know my daughter you know she, uh, yeah I mean I'll, I'm I'm giving her a cut let's say for the money I made <laughs> because I really yeah. valued those suggestions. You know, yeah. I, I want to feel like she's part of. So in future projects now, you know, I try to encourage her to come along and see what I'm doing. I mean, she's got her own business, but she's still interested. Yeah. And, and if she makes a good suggestion, I'll, you know, I won't write her into the contract or anything, but I'll, I'll give her a cut. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and I think that's to do. Her, that's, you know, um, yeah, that's great. Very cool. And so you mentioned earlier about uh, trad realism. Do you kind of see your future art, your your practice? uh you know that you create going in this direction moving forward or is this something you'll kind of like try here and there um i think uh like the project i'm working on more vellum i think it's yeah it has gone more in that direction i mean some of the efforts really do look like they've been kind of drawn and and but there's there's still the, the whole photon stream kind of approach. I still want to explore that, and maybe with some in real life exhibitions with because that I, that approach I still feel like animated. That can be really kind of powerful, and you know I'd like to make art that kind of maybe evokes a sense of meditation, and that's what um, maybe the photon stream work will morph into um but yeah i don't who knows you know I, who knows what i'll be doing in five years i certainly won't be doing the same thing um well i hope not otherwise you know i've, I've not you know that's not what an artist <laughs> yeah i guess time will tell you know yeah. i'm sure yeah. when you work on your next project which we'll talk about in a little bit you know quasi dragon studies and your future projects i'm sure you'll just evolve over time i think it just naturally at least I think it just kind of naturally happens. Is that right? Right. I mean, it's been happening for the last twenty-five years. Yeah. You know? I haven't. Uh, you, if you if you you know if you're still making the same thing a year later, you're kind of stuck. I would yeah. say you know, and but maybe too attached to what you've a past success. I mean, it's going to be. I you know I think I mean, Fontana was quite you know it was really well received, and I was totally amazed at the reception. But it might be hard for me to repeat that. I don't know. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a high, a high bar. Something about that project captured, you know, uh, certainly the people on Block Talks to Imagination. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe I won't be able to repeat that for a while. But, I mean, I, I will certainly try hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah, let's talk a little bit about um, what goes into each mint, each, each uh, art piece. You know, can we talk through mm -hmm. just some of the features found in uh, each of these uh, Fontanas? Um, uh, yeah, it might be easier if I share. Yeah. Share my screen. Yep. Um, 
Um, let's open up some actual mints, maybe. So, um, yeah, I haven't really talked about this, but there's <clears throat> so one of the um, there's this thing called containment. Um, and containment is, um, so this one by the looks of things has no containment. So these, these things I'm calling sprays, right? What containment does is when a spray, um, has, has a corner, you know, they got four corners on each and one of the sprays, they're kind of like a bent rectangle. But if one of those corners is outside of the, the canvas that lays outside here, the containment will turn that spray into a transparent version of it so you know just make it transparent and it will set the color to very similar to the background it'll be a slight variation on it so what happens so this one has got full containment on all sides so if you look none of these sprays they get very close to the edge but they'll stop just short and and you get this you get this kind of like cloudiness and that's because there would be a spray here, for instance, it's been turned the same, a very similar color to the background and maybe, you know, like a, a one or 2% transparency. So it kind of clouds over and how much that element has been, how opaque it is, is what I call, um, shit, what do I call it? Uh, overpainting. Mm -hmm. So the more, more opaque they are, the more you get this background color kind of cover the, cover the, the main elements um this one is also you know fully contained so the containment can happen on the top and bottom on the left and right or it can happen on all sides so this one looks like it's contained uh it's contained on the top and bottom it's a very simple output so it's kind of hard to tell um This one clearly has no containment. Um, so, no. Oh, so this is a good example. Contain. So you see, there's no element. There's no sprays that cross the top and the bottom of the canvas. And you mm -hmm. see, it, it's very kind of like subtle here because there's lots of layers of background transparency. So lots of sprays that are transparent with the background color. And here they just shoot off the side. Um, and so this whole approach. So I'm fascinated with like the boundary of, a, of an image, you know? Um, so it, to me, I'm really interested in trying to create a way that makes that boundary looks like it's, it's been cropped there for a good, you know, for a good reason. So it's sort of like, I mean, Rembrandt was the master of this, right? You see his comp, you see his self portraits and stuff, but if you look towards as, as the painting moves towards the edge of the canvas, they kind of, it's almost like, you know, that edge couldn't be anywhere else. And if you put a bad frame on it and crop some of it, it just doesn't look quite right, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that was part of the whole thing with this worn edge as well. Um, it kind of creates this kind of almost like this rounding as it gets to the edge. Um, but here, I mean, this 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 piece here, um, I think this mint here as well. Yeah, this is this. So this might not be, containment which causes all these sprays to stop here it might be just that that the, the kind of like the geometry just finishes here i'm not sure unless i looked at the features but um there is another example of something like that here this one well this one looks like this edge is contained but it's not i think it's just a coincidence that these sprays stop here and that's quite unusual i think I haven't seen another one quite like that, maybe apart from that one. So then the other traits, there's uh, potential flow. And that relates to kind of like the complexity or in fountain terms, the amount of volume of water running over the, fa over the, over the fountain. Um, and I call it potential because you can have a potential flow of one and still get something a little bit complex, you know, it's, but just because of the way the algorithm's built, you don't, I don't have that sort of fine. It's just, everything's a potential the way I built this. 
Um, so you could still get some complex, so emergent complexity, even with a flow of one. Um, and what's the other trait? There's four altogether. Yeah, it looks like composition, containment, overpainting. Oh, yeah, so composition, this is a symbol. I had symbols in photons, dreams. <laughs> I think it's going to be a common theme. It's just a very centered output, and yeah. they're always popular, you know? Um, I see the, the, the single, it's like a way into the body of work because it, somehow it's just more, this extra symmetry, it's just easier to digest visually. So, mm -hmm. so the singles, and I like the singles, you know, I'm the same as everybody else. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, it's a nice, nice clean look to it. Yeah, so. I mean, the, the centers kind of, you know, they're offset a little bit, but I mean, but then you can get singles. That's a single. I'm pretty sure it's a single. <laughs> um, but, but because of the containment, these chunks here are missing. So you get something that's still quite asymmetric. Um, and then we have the cascade. Cascade is one. Cascades are, are going to be a little bit rarer because where is it? oh here's one. They're going to be rarer because um, I think in the end I didn't. I had cas I I removed the possibility of a uh, cascade happening with with containment as well because they were just too wishy washy in my opinion. They were just too fuzzy. So a, a cascade is where you've got three geometric elements and uh, kind of hmm, the centers of these the, the centers of these elements are way off the canvas and they're kind of like staggered around the canvas um and then the one in the background that can be anywhere and it's kind of often the thing in the background is very kind of like translucent so you don't see a lot of it you just see a lot of the kind of like these lines which are supposed to be like geometric kind of like guidelines and so forth Mm -hmm. and then there was um, a, a adjacent, which is more like um, no, it's not adjacent. This one, this one's adjacent. We got two, uh, yeah, two things. Geometries kind of facing each other, and they share a common um, the line in the middle. Um, it's like a cor uh, they share a cor common horizon. I'll call it horizon. Yeah. That's such a cool. That's such an incredible output right there. Also, to kind of highlight that that feature. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I do like complex ones myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, your website states that the project was you know coded with vanilla JavaScript and SVG, and you know, for people who aren't coders, for like the non coders, you know, what is what do each of those mean, and and why did you go that route for this project? Um, well, vanilla JS just means that there's no kind of, I'm not using any exterior, uh, external libraries. So I'm not using P5.js or anything. Um, I've never really used P5.js, to be honest. I've, I've looked at it, but for me, it's, it feels, it would feel like painting on it with a really long paintbrush. <laughs> I, I, I want to, I'm a control freak. So I want to have that kind of sense that I'm, I, I know exactly what's going on in the code. I mean, obviously, beyond JavaScript, they don't, you know, but, but at a JavaScript level, I want to know everything that's going on. I, I, and I really want to understand how everything's calculated and plotted on the screen. Because through that, through that sort of like, I think, deep understanding of what's happening, you can, you, um, it's just like, it's like a feedback loop. You 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 get ideas from from understanding what's going on, and you can tweak it in certain you, you, in certain ways. Which you can't if you're for me anyway. If I'm using a library and I don't quite understand the functions, although you you could reverse engineer it and look at. But um, I just want to work in a very direct and I would say quite simple way. You know, my I understand the elements I'm working with in terms of code. I understand really well. And it feels very direct for me to work with them. I, um, so I'm not kind of reliant on anything that's kind of fuzzy in my mind. I know, I feel like I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, so that's, so, and then SVG is just, uh, 
it's like a, a, a vector format um, and it's totally scale, scalable for that reason. And it's also incredibly fast. And a lot of us, I just don't think, realize how powerful SVG is. It's just, you just create it in a very meticulous way. Uh, so I mean, it might be the other reason people don't use it, but it's like insanely fast because um, it's, the browsers are very well optimized to, to use it. It's been around for a long time now. I, you know, and um, yeah, it's, it's incredible how quick it is. Uh, it blows my mind, you know, a Fontana has got, you know, tens of thousands of objects. And the only reason it takes like a second to render is just the textures. It's not actually the SVG. The SVG is instantaneous pretty much in those milliseconds. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's what that is. Cool, great. and. And what, what's the preferred way that you see collectors displaying this art? Is it, you know, more digitally? Are you, are you, what do you think, what are your thoughts on, you know, prints? Are you offering prints to people? Yeah, I'm, so that's what I've been starting to work on since getting back from Mark from building a little portal so I can try and streamline prints for every project I do because it's kind of a, it's a bit of a pain in the ass. It's just logistically getting all the addresses, verifying wallets and stuff. So, yeah. but yeah, so I, I'm hoping they'll come out nice. I haven't seen one printed yet, but I'm kind of excited to see one. I think they'll, I think they'll be good printed. I mean, I'm, in my mind, I designed this project to be displayed on people's walls. So, um, yeah, I'm, another few weeks, and I should have a couple of test prints at least. And and I want to do big ones. I think I can go up to like sixty inches by seventy five, which is pretty wow. nice. Yeah, that'd be nuts. The framing yeah. on that must be must be pretty wild and expensive. Well, I'm like, gonna be framing them. I'll be too. So that's not my okay. problem. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I know I know there will be collectors that will, you know, get that size. So I'm curious. I would love to see photos of that when it happens. Yeah, and that's the other reason I'm gonna make an exception and go big with these ones, just because I I really want to you know get those images of people of them in in real life settings. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Very yeah, cool. fingers crossed that will come out okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, let's let's jump into you know. Can you share some of your favorite mints? Maybe some of the mints that uh, that surprised you. Okay, um, you know, I'm still finding like, I I mean, I've looked through the whole project a, a number of times, but because it's been shared quite a lot on block talk, every every day, I'm like on block talk, and I'm like, oh, shit, I never seen that one before, and. <laughs> you know, and I'll find ones. I think, oh, I really like that one, but I've, somehow I've not noticed it in the thumbnails. So, like, um, surprised me. Um, this one is kind of, I think this is a very unique one. It's got a di very different feel to many of the other ones. It's kind of, I've got this on quite a small monitor, so it might look a bit crappy. But, um, it's just got a lot of sort of like, um, I don't know how to describe it. It just feels very spacey, <laughs> not so solid as the other ones, you know, it's sort of ethereal almost with these very, you know, a lot of these bow tie structures, I call them bow ties, are a sort of a similar scale in this one. Um, I really like this one. I think it's a flow potential six. So it's, um, I don't think it's for sale. That one was kind of cool. And I was surprised that we only got one completely minimal one, wow. you know, uh, probably it, 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 there probably should have been two or three of them in 500, but there was only one. Um, but it's kind of nice that there's only one It's you know, it's been memefied a number of times. <laughs> Ramsey boy has been what, what magic on a bunch of my mints. Yeah. Um, definitely. So when you were going through like the testaments, like when you were, you know, coding, working on the project, did, how, how many times did something like this pop up where it was kind of just pretty much? Well, blank? there was one, but then I only done 300 and I done, actually, you know, I had done a lot of test mints. So I done, I think just 350 test mints. So I expected another one to pop up, but it did. I think there are some which are pretty close to it, you know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I kind of agonized over the distribution of complexity, <laughs> a lot, but I think in the end it worked out just right. Cause the simple ones, I mean, I, don't know if I like the complexity, but the simple ones kind of like they, they reveal more about how it's built, I think, and they kind of make context 
they give context to the complex ones. So, you know, if they're all complex, the series wouldn't be as strong, I don't think. It wouldn't wouldn't have the same story. So, um, um, well, yeah, it'd be nice to kind of display, like if somebody got prints, like a triptych, where it'd be, you know, a very minimalistic one, maybe something with a little bit more to right. it, and then kind of like a complex kind of show that that progression or like the possibilities within this uh, within this project. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think they do work, you know, that way, you know, when you've got, you know, yeah, like you say, when you've got a complex and a simple one together, this one is kind of fun just because it looks like a blue whale. It doesn't mm -hmm. anyway. Um, <laughs> and just the reference to whales in the space, you know, I think it's kind of funny. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, in terms of my fight, I don't really have a favorite, but I mean, I do like these complex ones here. I like the kind of range of different, like linear textures and stuff on this one. Um, yeah, how did you go about deciding on like how complex a specific mint should get? Like, was there, like when you were kind of testing things out, were there some, you know, outputs that were just like way too much? You're like, all right, I need to kind of scale right. this back a little bit or, or how did yeah. that? Um, yeah, so I did recently have it go up to 10 <laughs> in terms of, but we see, with Fontana, if you just increase the complexity, you just increase the layers, and, and there's only so much will show through. Mm -hmm. So once you get to about six or seven in, in this scale anyway, you don't actually gain any more complexity because it's just all hidden behind sort of like subsequent layers. Um, but it was kind of, I, I think I agonized more about how, because I really like, I do like the complex ones. It's just about kind of like, how, how much of each type of complexity you want in 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 the algorithm to make the, the set work as a whole. Um, and then there's different ways to have different types of complexity, right? I mean, um, some of these, you know, when you get a lot of bow ties, it's very, sometimes you get so much complexity that it becomes more unified, if you know what I mean. It's kind of like noise almost. So you can have a lot of, both you can have a lot going on but then you kind of read that as more of a kind of a unified feel and other things can like come to the fore so this is kind of dance it's, yeah it's just a lot of tweaking basically and look you know generating new outputs and pondering and and uh you know but that's what makes it art <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah at the end of the day you know that's that's what uh yeah what we love so um, well, yeah, you have a website where people can learn more, you know, about, about the project. Can you uh, mention that to the folks tuning in? Yeah, it's patent.co. Um, I've got all my work from, you know, the last 25 years on there. There's all sorts of stuff, um, you, uh, including sort of work in progress. Um, but I, I try to keep that up pretty up, up to date. Um, and I also, I've now started to systematically share my work in process uh, generators so people can come on here and just generate. I saw output. that. Yeah, uh, I noticed that the other day and I was kind of just going through Fontana, just like cycling through all the different outputs. I thought that was a lot of fun. And I think that's just a fun way for people who are, you know, curious about how an algorithm works to kind of, you know, see for themselves, hit that like mint button, so to speak, without, you right. know, without them being like official, you know, I think that's just like a great way for, mm. for people to understand what, you know, you as artists are, are, are doing. So yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think it's super fun to do. Yeah. It's the feedback I got from the buyers, you know, it's one thing I'm going to test mints, but just the magic of hitting the refresh button. It's just, it's diff just different. I mean, we take it for granted. Yeah. There's as artists yeah. all day long, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a sense. I think that you, you know, the person who clicks the button is, making the image right i want to give that feeling you know um, yeah absolutely yeah well we'll include the link to your website in the show notes but i, I do want to touch base on just a little bit about um it looks like a, an, another release that will happen in early 2023 it's called quasi dragon studies which you mentioned earlier do, can you tell us you know any details about this uh this upcoming release well it'll be an art blocks drop oh shit i don't, I don't know if i can say that but <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, maybe it's an art blog. Well, let me just maybe say that. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> um, 
so you know this was a project built um it's going to be i don't know january february i guess i i don't know where i haven't even kind of got it into staging yet but it should go pretty quickly when i do um do you mean just talk about the history of it or like, like the background? Yeah, yeah, you can touch just a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, I think people are just interested as you've been sharing, you know, some of the outputs on Block Talk and, you know, on your right. social media. Right. So, yeah, I'll share my screen again and just whiz through some of these. So, it started off with this project called Shapes of Medusary, which these outputs kind of look to me, they look like, you know, tankers, Buddhas, like Tibetan Buddhist kind of paintings. Um, and I done this. This wasn't a generative project. This was just all done by hand, you know, like 12 years ago before I got into writing code to make art. So I always you know, had this in the, I always liked this project and I wanted to investigate it generatively. And so I, I you know, I, it was a pain in that. It was a, it was a really difficult project actually to code because everything's so constrained geometrically. Um, and you don't obviously, there was no, to make the code small, I had to kind of like programmatically make every little element. So it's no sort of like path data in the code. Um, but I found like the outputs were just too compositionally samey for, for a whole series, long form say, series. So I kind of, I forked the project and I came up with this more kind of like, you know, the compositions are more asymmetric with this and I'm, um, so that's where that's where that came from. Um, I might change the name. I don't know yet. I'm still not sure if the if it, the quasi dragon is this kind of thing where dragons are not real, but quasi dragons is like unreal real thing. So it's this kind of play mm -hmm. on you know it's this pseudo dragon. So um, and they kind of obviously look like dragon or they got these kind of scales. They kind of look like fish or something. Yeah. Um, um, but the project is more or less finished, you know, it's a little, few little tweaks, cool. but I think it would suit, it's going to be a small run, probably two, 250, maybe. Okay. Um, Great. It looks beautiful. It looks stunning. You know, I think, I know you were, you were mentioning, you know, a follow-up project, like what that kind of looked like after Fontana. And I think you really nailed it. It looks, I don't know. I was, I was cycling through some of those outputs on, on the website and, yeah, super excited for this release in you know early twenty twenty three. Thanks. Yeah, it's certainly different. I think quite different enough from Fontana, you know. Although I'm still sort of using the Fontana texture. <laughs> yeah, I I yeah. could tweak that a little bit so it's a little bit more different, but um, I don't think I've exhausted it yet. Cool. Well, yeah, we look forward to you know seeing that release in early of next year. Right. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about uh, Marfa, Texas. I, I saw you. And your wife there and i had a blast and I'm, I'm curious you know from you your perspective this is i believe your first time in marfa you know like tell us about your experience like did you have a good time like what did you do what did you, what was your kind of your takeaways from from being in marfa in the middle of nowhere right yeah so just being there in, in amongst you know friends i i'd never met before it, it was a highlight of my year it was just fantastic you know the sense of kind of community um just the end everybody seemed to be having a great time and you know you could, you know for me i've been interested in making generative art obviously for a long time and then to suddenly be in the middle of a desert with 500 people i don't know how many people who all want to talk about generative art it's just insane you know i can i couldn't have ever imagined it you know like a year ago even so you know because I've never, I, I didn't have any friends even for the last 20 years to talk about this stuff with, because I mean, it's just too techy, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. put it on, but no, there's all these, yeah, so yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, I was in my element, I like meeting people, I, I love meeting collectors and people are just interested, you know, coming to the space from different walks of life and, and different backgrounds. So, you know, I was trying to talk to as many people as possible just to learn more about, you know, what people you know, their perspective on the space. Um, and Martha is just one of the weirdest places I've ever been to in my life. It's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I think it's great that it takes an effort to get there, right? Yeah. <laughs> it kind of fills Especially that. for you. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it was yeah, 30 hour drive to get there just because I wanted wow. to take my dog. Um, and my dog seemed to love it. 
<laughs> he was a fan favorite. Like honestly, uh, whenever whenever we walked up to you, it, it just had wagging his tail and just yeah. I don't know. It's it's like nice to see like when my dog's not here to kind of go out and meet yeah. some other dogs. So that was really cool. But he, he loves it. He loves meeting people. I took him to Planet Martha one night and he went clubbing <laughs> and he, he wagged his tail the whole way home back to the Airbnb. He's never I never seen him look so hyped up in his life. <laughs> oh man. Because <laughs> he was meeting awesome. lots of drunk people and they were fussing over him and yeah. <laughs> it was that's that great. Was a blast. I'll definitely be there next year. And I'll and I'm already thinking, well, you know, can I do a project an in person drop or something there? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe get there a week early and set something up. I don't know, but I, I would really yeah. like to contribute to the whole, you know, thing. And, cool. And, yeah. Yeah. We always encourage artists and, you know, people in the community to, yeah, bring something. Yeah. There were some other minting opportunities around town, which kind of, I think that was great because it kind of helped spread different mm. pockets of things and then everyone kind of came together i think on saturday night for the you know the yeah. backyard barbecue but nice. it was really really great you know meeting you in person and i'm glad that you're able to meet you know other artists and as well as your collectors i think that's that's got to be a, an interesting thing to be like oh my gosh this is someone who's actually collected my work and wow. you know you never connected it's crazy i still cut you like i pinch myself every day you know just you know <laughs> i didn't sell a single piece of work <laughs> For, you know, yeah. for 20 years. So, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's just unreal. Um, it's awesome to hear. And I, I don't think you get that type of, I mean, although I didn't sell work, I was fairly, I did, I do have a foot in the traditional art world. You know, I spent a lot of time in galleries talking to a lot of friends who are artists and that kind of, it's almost like fandom. It, you don't get that in the traditional art world, you know, that kind of, that intense kind of like engagement with the work. I don't think, you know, a lot of people buy art and traditional art well, you know, to beautify the houses, but also it's like just purely as a statement, uh, as a, as a like status piece, you know, but it's a different level of kind of engagement in this space compared to what I've seen before. Um, and it's great, you know, so open. Um, it's so not pretentious, not yet anyway, you know, give it 20 years, maybe who knows, but <laughs> It's uh, it seems very open and honest and real at the moment. Um, and, you know, I'm just very grateful to be part of that. You know. Yeah. It's, well, it's, yeah. 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 It's just great to have you on. You know, the platform and to be able to showcase your art. And yeah, I'm curious. Do you have any plans to exhibit? You know, some of your work in person, like at IRL, sometime next year or in the future. Is that something that you're interested in or have plans for? Yes, I've got. You know, I'm talking to Bright Moments at the moment um, about something for early next year. It can't be too; cl it won't be too close to you know the other one. But um, mm -hmm. cool. So that will be in New York, most likely. I don't know how much I'm supposed to be saying about. It. I don't think they they mind. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. How about yeah. that? Well, you know, potential for fun. for next year. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that would be a great. development project. Um, but the, yeah, the idea of having this kind of big party on midnight that's really that that, that that sounds like a lot of fun i don't yeah. think i'll be able to take my dog but that will be <laughs> cool well yeah we're excited to hear you know more details as uh you know that comes up but yeah how can people reach you should they have any questions um so i'm pretty active on twitter i try to tweet several times a day uh, and you know I, so people can message me there don't dm me there discord on my Harvey Rainer channel, just DM me on Twitter, uh, on Discord, pattern.co. I mean, they're the main two, really. I don't check my email enough to suggest mm -hmm. people contact me there, but I do check it. It's crazy how things have shifted, you know, over time. Right. It's like, all right, email used to be the big thing. Now it's like, all right, Discord and Twitter now. Right. It's just so much more natural, conversational, right? And, and yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, but I'm always happy to talk to anybody, you know. I like talking about art. As you can tell, I talk too much. So, no, no, this has been fantastic. It's it's so great to talk to you about you know this project and to see you know your project have the curate be a part of the curated collection. Um, yeah. yeah. So congratulations on the success of Fontana and you know what you've done with your art career over the last year. I think it's. I hope you're happy with that. And yeah, we look forward to seeing more of your artwork on on the platform. Yeah, I'm thrilled. I'm I'm not going anywhere you know, unless I. Either die or lose my eyes. Um, 
I'll keep, I'll keep making up, you know? Um, yeah, let's not make that happen. But yeah, thank, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Harvey, for being on After Dinner Mints. It's been, like I said, it's just been a pleasure talking to you again. And yeah, I'm excited to see what you uh, come up with in, in 2023. So thanks for being on today. Thanks for having me, Ponya. It'd be great to talk to you as usual. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Great. And uh, yeah, so we got some news and notes. Uh, as always, uh, After Dinner Mints discussions are available as a podcast. It's available on Spotify, Apple, Google, and Amazon. And finally, we have a weekly newsletter that gets delivered once a week with information on upcoming releases and generative art-related news. You can find a link to the newsletter in the description of this YouTube video. I want to thank our guests again, Harvey, for being on After Dinner Mints. Make sure you comment, like, and subscribe to the Artblux YouTube channel. Be kind to each other, buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, Harvey. Thank you.